Hello and welcome back to another episode of Young Dad Game Reviews, the series where I recount, reminisce, and review the games that I grew up on, and decide when or if my son will grow up on the same games, and which ones should be avoided for now due to extreme violence, suggestive themes, or because the game just sucks. Next up... The suffering ties that bind. Something dark and unspeakable left you deeply scarred. Released one year after the first game in 2005 for Xbox, PS2, and PC, The Suffering Ties That Bind didn't exactly see favorable sales as much as its predecessor. Is it because this game was too much like the first game, or not enough? A few changes were made to this game, some good and some bad, but what could it have been that caused this game to be the final part and what was originally planned to be a multi-series game? Well, let's take it apart piece by piece and figure that out. The story, or the lore, is again where this game shines. It picks up immediately where the first game ended, so if you have a save file on the same memory card, the game will give you one of three different intros depending on what morality you ended with in the first game. Right away you get picked up by a shady corporation known as the Foundation, run by a sexy Envy Adams looking chick named Jordan. Of course things go bad and Torque makes his escape through the streets of Baltimore. Did you eat crops? Did you eat crab? Crab? I ate too. As Tor goes through the streets of Baltimore, he uncovers more about his past with his wife Carmen and his dealings with a kingpin named Blackmore. Fun fact, Blackmore is voiced by the amazing Mr. Michael Clark Duncan. May he rest in peace. Tork also runs into Copperfield, a former slave hunter and the Creeper a pimp turned serial killer who straight up has the remains of his prostitutes trying to escape from his body. Kinda like Freddy in Nightmare Part 4, the Dream Master. Again, the suffering does not shy away from the dark themes. These two are the stand-ins for Horus and Hermes from the first game, but we also get the return of a familiar face in the form of Dr. Killjoy. Much like the first game, I had a few issues with my audio when starting the game for the first time. This time, it was in the fact that none of the characters would speak during cutscenes. Although I thought everyone was just standing around staring at each other like the standoff in the good, the bad, and the ugly before I realized what's going on. Much like the first game, it's due to the sound options and the Dolby files not working as intended on newer hardware like Windows 10. I tweaked some settings in the options and everything was fine after that. Then I loaded the game up again and it crashed. No, no, we're, we're not doing this again, are we? Luckily, no. This was the only time this happened to me. Like in the first game, there's a lot of character dialogue and they're just as entertaining to listen to. Mostly due to this guy being the main villain. Yeah, that's right. I'm a last minute entry. And now I'm playing this game. Blackmore owns Eastern now. Particularly you two. Ain't a living soul that owns Tort. He ain't no slave, and neither am I. Bluster is the tool of the sucker player. Torque now has a few lines as well. Though his voice sounds a little familiar too, doesn't it? Looks like trouble. The gunplay and enemy sounds are quite the same as the first game with a similar music theme. Being that the games were released pretty close to each other, I understand using the same sound effects and music. Like the first game, they needed to create some interesting boss characters, and they did, but what really stands out for them is their voices. They sound creepy and dark, but they're definitely not as captivating as Horus and Hermes. Luckily, our favorite creepy doctor makes a return and steals every scene that he's in. I also noticed this game doesn't really have as much vulgarity as the first one. WHATEVER MOTHERFUCKER! Okay. How do you say motherfucker in Spanish? <laughs> the
The graphics have slightly improved and are a bit nicer to look at. There are new locales you'll be frequenting such as the streets of Baltimore, a rundown movie theater, a crack house, another prison, and even some kind of hellish area. Torque himself even looks a bit sharper and has a cool looking holster now. Also, he finally learned that shoes are important when fighting monsters. My only biggest complaint about the visuals is how the big bad guy looks like... Well, he looks like a, the bad guy. No one would really trust a dude with a face like that. I don't care who you are. Most of the enemies from the first game make a return, but each have a fresh redesign now as they're no longer based off of forms of execution. Instead, they represent facets of both modern life and past violence in the streets of Baltimore. I think it's an awesome change to the enemies in their designs. While Slayers originally represented death by dismemberment, they now represent knife crime. Marksmen are military suppression of civil unrest, and mainliners are drug dealings. In Insanity Mode, your inner beast looks cooler and has a different colored aura glowing around you depending on which morality you're going for. The gameplay has also seen a bit of a change. You can't collect zombie and bottles or batteries anymore. Instead, you can only find and use them in fixed locations, and you can only carry two weapons at a time. A neat addition, though, is the ability to dual wield any one handed weapon. Believe me, you'll feel like a supreme badass. Groovy. Even with a two weapon limit, the enemies don't feel as bullet spongy as before, and the combat is quite fun and a bit challenging now. You really feel the power behind your weapons when you play in first person, which adds more fun to the game. The game has a more cinematic feel than its predecessor, introducing enemies just to lightly damage and scare you before you actually face them for the first time. New enemies include Maulers, which represent slavery, and they also remind me of those dog things in Nightmare Part 2. Gorgers, which represent an urban legend told to the kids in Baltimore to explain the food shortage, or about the tale of a priest who found, took, and cooked dead bodies and fed them to the starving people without them knowing. Silent breed is people! Yeah, pretty sick shit. Like in the first game, you'll run into NPCs you'll either need to defend, kill, or just ignore, which affects your morality in the game's ending. The difference in this one? The NPCs actually do a decent job of fending for themselves, and your morality also gives you different abilities for insanity mode. The first is a chain-like whip that comes out of your back. The second is growing a bunch of guns, like the Triggerman or the Marksman, which you just unload, like in that one scene from Predator. The final one has you disassemble like something out of Hellraiser and destroy all the enemies around you. New enemies, known as captains, can only be killed during insanity mode. Though rarely used in the first suffering, they've made it more fun and accessible in this one. And since it doesn't negatively affect your morale or health anymore, it's fun to just rip and tear. With all these changes and cliched ending, is The Suffering Ties That Bind a sequel that fails in the wake of its predecessor? I actually enjoyed the gameplay and combat much more than the first Suffering game. Jumping back and forth between guns to fit different situations felt interesting and gave a sense of strategy to this game. Being able to use Insanity Mode more and being rewarded for your moral choices give this game a unique feel, but there are too many similarities too close to the original to make it feel like its own game. Instead, it feels more like an expansion, albeit a very fun expansion. The original was definitely creepier, and in the back of your mind you're, you constantly question did I kill my family? Since you were told at the end of the first game who killed your family, the reveal at the end of this game feels like a bit of a letdown. The Ties That Bind didn't have a strong mystery like its predecessor taking the suspense out of the game. 
You, the player, end up not really caring what more of the answers were as to why your family was murdered. You just want revenge. Overall, I give the suffering ties that buying three and a half split psyches out of five. While the combat is more enjoyable, the suffering felt more original and intriguing, while the second one just takes moments that made the first one memorable and just added a few tweaks here and there without actually building on the original foundation. I did enjoy this game though even 15 years after release thanks to good old games. As for games I would let my son play, much like the first one I'd have to give this one a sorry buddy, maybe when you're a teenager. And as for nostalgia value, I didn't really have any with this game. But this game does get a special pass because of Michael Clark Duncan. I loved any movie that he was in. He was a gentle giant that was taken from us way too soon. September 3rd was the 8 year anniversary of his passing, so here's to you Big Mike. Rest in peace. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like. Leave a comment down below for games that you would recommend. Hit the subscribe button and ring that bell if you'd like to be notified when I release new videos. Don't forget to also check out Ellie's channel for amazing covers for music. I'm just fucking stumbling through this whole goddamn thing. Don't forget to check out Ellie's channel for amazing covers. Also, don't forget to check out Ellie's channel for amazing covers for music. This is our second stop on Halloween Town, so until the next video, I'll see you guys on the other side. Bye bye You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. You got troubles, I got him too There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you Just stick together, we can see it through Cause you got a friend in me You got a friend in me